Well, you're gonna get a chance to hear this um, as I pray heading into the message. You're gonna hear this again in the coming weeks because I think this news needs to go out full force. Uh, it is news that came this last month from the Gallup organization. Many of you know they do polling in our nation, and they've done one poll consistently for the last 20 years, since 2000. And it's a poll that tests to see uh, where the mental health of our nation is at. Pretty important question to ask, don't you think? So this last year, get this, in the first time in the history of the poll, this last year, one of the categories they test is self-reporting of those who report being in excellent mental health. They test demographics, all the demographics you can imagine, men, women, political parties, age groups, uh, race, everything. They test everything, including church attendance or more to the point, religious service attendance. There was only one category of all these categories that showed an increase over the previous year. Just one. You wanna take a wild guess what it was? Those, listen carefully, those who attend worship weekly. Now think about it, think about it. Just, I wanna to clap too, but just think about it for a minute. Let it sink in. And if you're joining us um, online, I want you to know, it doesn't distinguish on the location. It's the habit. But one of the great dangers we're facing because of public policy is, you know, you've probably heard the phrase, you form a new habit or lose a habit every 30 days. Now I'm gonna talk about this more again in the future, but get this, I've coached baseball for over 20 years. I know as a coach, I can't show up and just throw the ball in the field and expect the players to organize themselves. Does everybody know that's true? Do you notice kids take the path of least resistance? Do all of you know you're just grown up kids? So here's, here's what I'm really saying. God wants us to have structure in our life. That's why he encourages us to do things that are good for our soul, like weekly worship. And it, it cannot be missed. Whatever God asks us to do is good for us. And here's the deal. The primary purpose of worship is not about us at all. Did you know that? It's about glorifying and magnifying the one who's worthy. And the beautiful thing about our Lord is when you put him first, he can't help but splash blessing on us. Thanks be to God. Now listen, I was reading in my devotions and I wanna pray as we get ready to hear God's word. From Psalm 119, verse 116, listen to this word. Sustain me, my God, according to your promise, and I will live. Do not let my hopes be dashed. You know, we need to be renewed constantly, not just during Christmas time, but weekly in where true hope comes from. And true hope comes from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So now we're gonna lift him up. We're gonna hear from him. So pray with me if you would. Lord Jesus, bring the hope that you brought that first Christmas night. Bring it again in a fresh way. Renew each heart, encourage each heart, bless each heart. Whether we are together in this room or joining online, God, this habit that we want to engage in because you called us to do it because it's good for our soul, Lord, bless our socks off right now. Come Holy Spirit, that Jesus would be magnified not just in the preaching of the word, but in our lives. And we pray this in your beautiful name, Lord. And everyone agreed and said together, amen. I was confessing this morning with my prayer group that um, there was a season early on where, uh, this is embarrassing to say, there was a season early on in my ministry where I thought, well, I have, I, can I learn anything new about the Christmas season? <laughs> Has anyone felt that way? Right? Good. You're smart. You're like, I'm not putting my hand up. <laughs> right? And it was, I don't know, it was about 10 years ago. It's since I've been here at Christ Community. And some of you know I've spent several of the last years actually digging into, during the Christmas season, some of the less preached on passages in the Christmas story. And there's a reason for that. Not only do I need it for my soul, but as I've dug into those things, 
just for my own edification, I realized this, in, in my profession, they say this preaches. And, and it's no different today. It's something that we talk about indirectly, and I want to dive into it today. We've been talking about why we do things in our church family. Why do we decorate? Why do we sing? Why do we go to parties? And why do we have trees? Have you noticed we have a Christmas tree here? Well, actually, we have several of them. Three of them in the room. Well, maybe more. I'm, I might be, you know, missing one, right? How many of you have a Christmas tree up in your house? Or how about this? How many of you have put one up at some point in your life, right? Now, you all know the Christmas tree, of course, is prominently displayed in the Christmas story. You've heard this, right? Many times read before. I think it comes in Luke chapter 2. Uh, let me read it for you. You ready? It goes something like this. Um, so they, the, the, the shepherds, hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger right underneath a noble fir. No, it's not there. Don't, don't say, oh, he's a heretic. Uh, it's not there. Yeah, there's, there's no Christmas tree in the Christmas story. So why do we do it? Well, here's part of the thing about it. And it's something, something I think Christians have to always weigh out. Why do we do what we do? So if it's not specifically in the Christmas story, should we do it, for example? That's a good question. It's a great question. So here's one of the things that we realize. In the world around us, people celebrate Christmas. People celebrate Christmas who have no idea what it's about. And one of the reasons they celebrate Christmas is because some of their favorite movies, including mine, come during the Christmas season. Right? Have you noticed most Christmas movies don't really have anything to do with the real reason? Like, even some of my favorites that my family loves to watch. Like, I love a Christmas story. My wife doesn't. I sat her down and made her watch it. How many of you do that to a loved one, right? Yeah, we do that, right? I love this. You will watch it with me, right? It's a good thing that her favorite Christmas movie I love as well. It's Elf. Anybody else? Which, by the way, is pretty much the only family-friendly Will Ferrell movie you can find, okay? So Elf, we love Elf. Um, there's a new Christmas show out. Have you seen it? Some of you know. The Mandalorian. Have any of you watched this? Yeah, you know why it's a Christmas story? Because there's a baby Yoda in it, right? Uh, that is a joke, all right? It's a joke. Someone was telling me last night, you didn't mention my favorite Christmas movie, Die Hard. <laughs> right, we've talked about that before. Die Hard's not actually a Christmas movie. It came out in July when it was originally released. Anyway, I digress. You see all the useless information sometimes that is packed into my head? How about this one? Home Alone, anybody seen that one? Home Alone was made 30 years ago, 1990. People still follow and, you know, they love that movie. It's a good Christmas movie. The follow-up to it was Home Alone 2, Lost in New York. And there's this scene where Kevin's in New York City. He goes to Rockefeller Center, and he prays in front of the Christmas tree. I just rewatched the clip. I had to get in touch with it. By the way, it is an awesome prayer to the Christmas tree, right? And one of the things about that subtle message is, can, is Christmas really just about whatever God you sincerely talk to? What is it really about? And so Christians might say, and I might be one of these people, if it causes that much confusion, why do we do it? It's a great question. Historically speaking, Christians have answered that question in one of several ways. They run away from anything that causes confusion. I understand that. But also, what I was talking about before, Christians have tried to find things in the cultural narrative of the people that they find themselves in and bridge it to tell the story of Jesus. It was no different in Europe, in Germany in particular, where the Christmas tree was bridged to tell the Christmas story. In fact, according to popular legend, it was Martin Luther himself, the great reformer, who brought the tree inside the house for the first time and put candles on it. Because he wanted to highlight the, you know, the stars and wanted his kids to, to see within the house the majesty of the birth of Christ. Why do we use trees? Well, the people around us use trees 
And even though the Christmas tree is not in the Christmas story, let me, let me say it this way. I hope you hear this clearly. Trees play a prominent role in the narrative of Scripture. And in particular, the story of Jesus. That's why we use Christmas trees. That's why we decorate here. It's why I decorate with one in my home. Because when I look at the tree, I see something that I know most people don't. I see the story of my Savior. And I want to talk about that with you and, and un unwrap it. Some of this you've been hearing because we've been trying to layer it as we've been going through this series. So if you've followed in some of the previous messages, you've heard this first point. So why do we use the Christmas tree? What does it mean to us? And number one, the first thing I want to say is it is a reminder of God's plan. The tree, when you see it, is a reminder of God's plan. And God's plan started at the beginning of the story. We've also been quoting each Sunday on purpose from Genesis 3 to drive this point home. The story of salvation starts with our disobedience. God was already prepared for it. It didn't take him by surprise. And so when the Lord pronounced judgment first on the man, then on the woman, and then on the serpent, on Satan, the Lord spoke that judgment, but also laid within it something that I like to repeat. Every time the Lord pronounces judgment, there's always mercy in the midst of judgment. There's the opportunity for mercy. And here's where it comes from. It's in Genesis 3, verse 15. The Lord is speaking to the serpent and he says, I will put enmity, that means conflict, between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He, you notice I've been highlighting uh, pronoun, pronouns through this series, right? He is singular. There's an important point being made here. He, one person will come who will crush your head. You will bruise his heel, you will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. Ever since then, the faithful have been waiting for the fulfillment of that promise. Well, all through up till Christ. That kind of prophetic promise, as we point out during the Christmas season, wasn't just unique to the garden story. Also, one of the critical stories, and I mentioned this as well, one of the critical stories in the story of God's people is the flight from Egypt, right? You can read an entire book about it. It's called the book of Exodus. And within the story of the book of Exodus is this point where God brings his people to Mount Sinai. And because his people don't know anything about how to worship, he gives them what we call the law. And hidden within the law is this little verse, Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, the second part of it. Anyone who's hung on a tree is under God's curse. Anyone who's hung on a tree. Now, if you go and read it, and I did, I reread De Deuteronomy 21 as well a couple weeks back just to get that feeling of the passage again. Because how many of you have ever heard, when you read scripture, you have to read it in context? You can't cherry pick verses, right? You can get lost if you do that, if you're just looking at one little phrase. So we want to read this passage. When you read this verse in context, it's like God is giving them instructions, and all of a sudden, you've probably had conversations with people like this, you know, you're having a conversation with one train of thought, and then another thought comes in, and you say, by the way, and then you return to the main thought. It's almost got that feel. The Lord is instructing the people, and then he goes, by the way, anyone hung on a on a tree is under God's curse. And then he continues the rest of the dialogue. When you read Deuteronomy 21, it just has that feel to it. It almost feels like a throw-in. And I wonder, because remember how we've talked about Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah through the fall? They would have memorized things like Deuteronomy 21. And they would have memorized all those verses, and they would have come across this verse and thought to themselves, like sometimes I've thought about when reading Scripture, now why is that in there? Well, now we know. You see, there are, as I said, hundreds, said a couple weeks ago, there are hundreds of prophecies about Christ in the Old Testament. Between his birth, his life, and his death, he fulfilled over 300 prophecies. By the way, just, just to be clear, you know there's some more still yet to be fulfilled because he's coming again. But let's stay focused on that first coming for just a moment. Here's how amazing the birth of Christ is from a mathematical point of view. If one person were to come along and just fulfill eight of the Old Testament prophecies, get this now, eight of them, 
it would be one, the chances of it would be one in 100 with 12, 12 zeros behind it. That number is called one in 100 quintillion. I had to look it up. It's a big number. I used to think trillion was a big number, but now we throw it around Congress a little loosely. Have you noticed that? <laughs> right? I digress. I digress. If you can't laugh, you'll cry. Everybody know what I'm talking about? So it's one in 100 quintillion. I want you to look at this. The chances of somebody fulfilling the prophecy of Christ is one person just fulfilling eight of them is one in 100 quintillion. 48 prophecies is one in one times 10 to the 157th power. They don't even give that number a name. In fact, once you get past like I think 50th power, they just call it a Googleplex or something like that. It's just ridiculously big. These are the numbers that, you know, physicists and mathematicians work with. No, no normal people work with these numbers, right? That's just 48 prophecies. That's not even one-sixth of the prophecies Jesus fulfilled in his birth, life, death, and resurrection. The odds of someone fulfilling these prophecies of Scripture in the Old Testament are astronomical. They're, they're impossible. And when I look at the tree, I'm reminded God had a plan right at the very beginning. Now, let me go back to this plan, because it goes back to what I talked to you about Moses in Deuteronomy 21. That's 1,400 years before Christ. So Christ comes along. He, he's born. He lives. He dies on a cross. Another way to say it is he dies on a tree. In fact, the New Testament writers, the Apostle Paul in particular, and Peter, actually say that. So here's my second point this morning about why we use trees. It, the Christmas tree, reminds us that on the cross, Jesus paid the price for our sin. All right, I want you to pause with me for a moment and hear the full weight and power of this. Most Christians get comfortable through the years with referring to themselves as sinners. They don't like it, but they get a little more comfortable. But there's not any Christian I know who really likes to think about the fact that we, human beings, are under a curse. Susan, go back to Genesis 3, if you would, really quick. It's a couple slides up. Genesis uh, 3, not Galatians 3, Genesis 3. There you go. So this passage, I told you earlier, the Lord spoke to the man, then he spoke to the woman, then he spoke to the serpent. They were judged. The Bible says that at that moment, they and creation were under a curse. The curse brings death. The curse causes separation. When you start to think about it in those terms, the curse is all pervasive. One of the important doctrines of Scripture is what we call original sin. It's not just the first sin of Adam but it's the fact that because of Adam's sin, all of us are born in sin. In other words, in origin, we are born in sin. We are under the curse when we're born. And what is the curse? Death and separation. Jesus came to put an end to the curse for those who hope in him. Galatians 3.13 says it this way. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who's hung on a tree. Now, I read this when I read the Deuteronomy passage through the years, and when I've read Galatians 3.13, I used to think, well, what does that mean? Was Jesus cursed, then hung on a cross? No, 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 no. If you read it carefully, what it says is that on the cross, Jesus became the curse for us. On the cross, he took the curse for those who trust in him so that the consequence of separation is removed and the reconnection that we were always intended for with the Lord is renewed. This same sentiment is also talked about in first, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 5, chapter 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then just this week, this is not a slide, but I want to read it anyway. It's in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. 
He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we are healed. You see, on the cross, Jesus took the curse. And it's right there in front of our eyes. The tree prominently displayed. I mean, if you have a live tree in your house, more to the point, a dead tree, which, by the way, is the only right way to have one. Right, ever? That's a joke too. Not a very good one, but it was. That tree has to be cut down and brought into the house. The minute it's cut down, it's dead. And it's ready to become wood. And it's the wood of a tree that becomes the cross. And on the cross is the gift. And this is the third point. We're going to talk about this Christmas Eve. Why do we give gifts? Because the tree points to the gift of God that gives eternal life. My friends, it's no coincidence that Christians starting putting the tree, the gifts that they gave each other underneath the tree. Because it's on the cross that Jesus takes the curse that the gift of eternal life is given. But the curse is not relieved for everyone. It's only relieved for those who believe. See, we don't pray to the Christmas tree. We pray to who the Christmas tree points to. The one who died on the cross and rose from the grave to pay the price for our sin and to give us the gift of eternal life. And when we believe on him, we certainly have the gift. And Christmas is alike a story that points to what we talked about in the reading. Each has to come and bend their knee. The shepherds, the wise men, and even Mary and Joseph. And say, as Mary did, Lord, may it be to me as you have said. Don't miss Christmas. Don't miss what Christmas is about. And if anyone here in this room or watching with us online, if you've never bent your knee and asked Jesus Christ to take the curse for you and ask him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, you're missing Christmas. And God doesn't want that for you. It is as simple as saying, Lord Jesus, thank you for taking the curse. I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And some miraculous transaction that happened in my life happens in yours because of the work of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. You know, around Easter time, we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Perhaps around Christmas time, we should say, Christ was born, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. In fact, I want to invite you to stand with me. Let's do that together. And if you're at home and you're able, please stand with us. Let's stand together. And let's say these words together with me, if you would. One of the great formulations of faith are those last three lines. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ is coming again. That's why we say it at Easter. But this is just as true at Christmas time. So let's say it together. Christ was born. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord God, you are coming again. You are going to fulfill the rest of that prophecy that we are waiting on. Jesus, you are the one that fulfilled all those prophecies. Only you, you and lo- you alone, and the greatest of those for me at least, that you came to take the curse for us, Lord God. Thanks for what you did, Jesus. Thank you for becoming the curse for taking our sin. And Lord, if there's anyone who's listening right now, I pray that my words would lend them aid and Holy Spirit, that you would come and and just do the work that only you can do to, to take that which is dead and make it alive again when we confess that Lord Jesus, you would take the curse for me and you would come and be my Lord and Savior. And Father, any praying, anyone praying those prayers right now, just overwhelm them with your blessing and the gift of the Savior. As we pray tonight or this morning and as we Lift up your name, Lord Jesus. Come, encourage each heart. 
as we sing these great songs, as we go through this Christmas season, as we have trees and decorations and we go, well, to different kinds of parties this year, of course, let it all point to you in our lives. Encourage you, church, we pray in Jesus' beautiful name. And everyone agreed and said together, amen. Let's sing this truth, amen.